Mike Green here for Real Vision. I'm excited to kick off the year 2021 uh, talking all around the globe. This is early morning in California, and I'm excited to sit down and talk with Russell Lamberti and Nick Hudson in South Africa. Gentlemen, welcome. Great to be Hi, with Mike. you. Good to be yeah. with you. Now, I met you two actually via a Twitter thread that I posted about the pandemic. Um, one of the members of your Panda network, which we'll discuss in a second, reached out to me and said, hey, you should really be looking at X. Um, I reached out to you, was put in touch with you two, and would love to know a little bit about you guys as, as we talk about the dynamics of the global pandemic, the organization that you've built, Panda, the pandemics data and analytics team, that is a global network of scientists. Um, let's start with just some brief background. Russell, to you. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, it's good to be with you guys. I'm a professional economist. Uh, I live in Cape Town. I run a boutique uh, research, uh, macro research business called ETM Macro Advisors. So my clients are predominantly fund managers and professional investors. I'm a big fan of Real Vision, actually. Been a, been a longtime supporter of the platform and uh, have enjoyed much of what you guys have done. Um, so my space is very much macro and markets, um, uh, you know, covering, you know, FX commodities, um, big picture stuff, business cycles. And I uh, have known Nick for a number of years uh, prior to, to, to 2020. And uh, when that hit, uh, we kind of decided to start. I mean, we were sharing ideas um, early on in this thing. And, and Nick kind of took the bull by the horns and, and I came along for the ride as well. So. So I'm, uh, I have an economics background. Uh, my strong suit is not um, virology um, or viruses or anything like that. Um, I've been looking a lot at the economic impacts. I've been learning as I go, of course, as we, we've all been on a crash course on virology in 2020, but uh, really uh, keenly focused on the economics and the, you know, the severe impacts of, of lockdowns and the curtailment of, of you know, trade freedoms and so on uh, has been really interesting for me this year. And of course, watching how um, you know, policymakers, central bankers, uh, governments have responded um, and have layered on, uh, you know, hugely uh, uh, activistic policies on top of these lockdowns has been very, very interesting for me to see and, and obviously try and figure out. So that's that's kind of the place that I come from. And so coming from that place, what do you think about Bitcoin? No, I'm joking. We're, we're gonna... <laughs> Nick, can you give me uh, your background as well? Yeah, sure. I'm. Uh, a, a, I run a middle market private equity fund uh, here in South Africa. Um, I am by qualification, although never by trade, uh, an actuary. Um, and I got into this story, as Russell said, just out of a sense of alarm as to how the reaction to this epidemic seemed to break all the rules of um, prior epidemics and run, as we see it, very much counter to the all the entirety, really, of pre-COVID science. Um, and uh, as our lockdown in South Africa started and then was extended and extended and extended again, gone, it's been going now for approaching 300 days, um, we became extremely alarmed and uh, decided to formulate our views in a paper that uh, was published in, when was it, Russ? Early May. Late April. Early May, yeah. Yeah. Early May. Um, so, yeah, that's that's the background of how we got into it. It started off being, you know, small multidisciplinary team, and now it's a very big one. We've got uh, probably around uh, 100 or so scientists predominantly, but also, as Russell says, economists and lawyers. And Hi, I'm Ralph Powell. Sorry to interrupt your video. I know it's a pain in the ass, but look, I want to tell you something important is I can tell that you really want to learn about what's going on in financial markets and understand the global economy in these complicated times. That's what we do at Real Vision. So this YouTube channel is a small fraction of what we actually do. You should really come over to realvision.com and see the 20 or so videos a week that we produce of this kind of quality of content, the deep analysis and understanding of the world around us. So if you click on the link below or go to realvision.com, it costs you $1. I don't think you can afford to be without it. team and now it's a very big one we've got uh, probably around uh, 100 or so scientists predominantly but also as Russell says economists and lawyers and uh, various people involved and uh, an advisory board that includes some of the finest minds in the field um, 
and uh, is not it's now a truly international organization, whereas it started as a South African one. And the, the reason for that jump was simply that we realized that the South African situation was being perpetuated under under air cover from the World Health Organization and under pressure from uh, various supranational organizations and foreign governments, and that uh, nothing was going to move in South Africa until something moved on the international front. And so we, we, we went international. So um, one of the things that I actually wanted to observe, I, I, in researching this piece and learning uh, and getting to know you too, and this is no offense to you, Russell, Nick, I, I have to compliment you in terms of some of the public appearances and speeches that you've given. I would encourage people to seek out podcasts that you did earlier in this process. Um, and from my experience, I like viewers know that I don't often say this. I, I have been incredibly impressed with the breadth of information and breadth of thought that you've put into this. So it creates a great background for me to, to move forward on this. Now, when you talk about the Panda Network, and again, that refers to pandemics, data and analytics, this is not an anti-science. This is not an anti-vaxxer, a pandemic denialist organization, right? This is an organization that is saying, wait a second, we I'm have- Not even close. Yeah, you know, we will- we have the platform for how to handle a pandemic. We have the pan. We, we know what we're supposed to do. There's a playbook that's been written. And so we can make all number of complaints about in the United States, how the Trump administration may have followed to play, follow that playbook. But on a global basis, people have broadly not followed that playbook. And, and it's very difficult to understand why. We'll dig into that in a little bit. But maybe you can give a explanation of what pandemic what panda actually stands for and what the platform means yeah i mean panda is a portmanteau for um <clears throat> pandemics data and analytics uh the name was chosen in haste because we we know from the time of forming the organization to launching our first paper was only a matter of days um but what the organization stands for is replacing what we see to be bad science with good science and very often it's simply a matter of understanding what the scientific wisdom was prior to December 2019 um, and getting our teeth into that. But there are a lot of subtleties and understanding the epidemiology, the virology, the immunology, um, the economics, the social aspects, the psychological aspects requires a really strong multidisciplinary team with experts and generalists. That's the key thing. You, this, this, const, this continuous refrain of you know, I only speak to epidemiologists is nonsense. An, an epidemic is one of the most complex things on earth and you need a diversity of skills. You definitely need epidemiological input, but that's not where your input should uh, begin and end um, because the, the setting is just so complex. Um, the, the, the whole ecology of the virome or the viral ecology, if you like, um, is something that is just of staggering complexity. So you need science, you need a lot of it, and it needs to be very open science, science that is uh, capable of engaging in continuous conjecture and refutation. It's not a, this is not a game where the word consensus or authority makes any sense at all, because a lot of the knowledge in these fields is really in its infancy and um, will remain so for a long time, such as the complexity. Well, it's one of the interesting dynamics I would actually suggest that's happened and you know, I often emphasize this this nature of cycles. So pandemics, I would point out viral pandemics are obviously slightly different, but by and large, we have gone an extended period of time without a significant global pandemic, in part because of the advances in modern science that treated many of the diseases that would have historically mm -hmm. led to those types of pandemics, whether they're smallpox or um, anthrax or any number of, you know, any number of other things that could have spread because we just didn't know where they came from. We didn't know to wash our hands. We didn't know to not eat infected wheat, et cetera. When you look at the dynamics of this pandemic today, have we followed the playbook? Are we, was this a function of us being unprepared or is this a function of us going off script? It's very much a function of going off script. Um, if you, you know, the, 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 the incredible irony here is that in December 2019, the World Health Organization updated its uh, pandemic response guidelines for respiratory viruses specifically. And in that, play, in that guideline, uh, set of guidelines, it's spelt out that you should never attempt quarantining of the healthy. 
Um, the, the term lockdown didn't really exist until uh, February this year. So the, the word isn't used in those, those guidelines, but they spell out why you shouldn't use uh, quarantining of the healthy, namely that the second order effects or the knock-on effects are much greater than the benefits. The cure is worth, worse than the, than the disease. Um, interestingly enough, there's another aspect that's not mentioned in the WHO guidelines because it's it's not general to respiratory viruses. It's specific to viruses that have highly graduated uh, mortality, age graduated mortality, meaning, you know, uh, so this is the case for coronaviruses. Coronaviruses are about one thousandth as deadly to young people as they are to old people. So it's extremely age graduated mortality. And the conventional and pretty basic epidemiology, um, when it comes to age graduated respiratory viruses or diseases in general, is that implementing general suppression measures can actually cause, is expected to cause, mortality to increase. Because what it does is it shifts the disease burden from the non-vulnerable to the vulnerable. If you can imagine that you have a choice, if you like, between allowing the disease to circulate uh, towards a herd immunity situation amongst uh, uh, the, the non-vulnerable people, that would be much better than allowing it to circulate amongst the vulnerable people. And so what you actually want in response to a respiratory virus is highly differentiated mobility changes. You want old people, vulnerable people to reduce their mobility and you want younger people to keep it the same or maybe even increase it. So that, so that the disease burden is borne by the people who are least at risk. So this is, we, we have the old wives' tale dynamic of this, right? And it's not an old wives', wives tale, it's a true story that we used to have children gather together for chicken pox parties, right? That you would try to get everybody effectively yeah. infected quickly before it became a problem for the older community that might not have been exposed, right? The adult form of the disease is disastrous the youth form of the disease is an annoyance and occasionally fatal, which is terrible. And, and I think that's one of the real challenges is there's an inevitability of sounding callous when you say that death is part of disease, death is part of life, right? It is difficult to come across as empathetic and human and to help people understand that you appreciate that. But there are the facts as they exist in wartime or any other condition in which people will die. It becomes a question of how many, and did you choose the most effective to have to die effectively, right? Um, it's, a, it's a terrible choice. Every general who sends troops into combat faces that exactly, right? But that's part of what you're yeah. communicating, it's, right? These utilitarian constructs are always very difficult, and I personally struggle a lot with uh, the whole concept of trade-offs and having to sit in some kind of godlike position and determine how they are to be arranged. Um, I, I guess intuitively I would... Uh, stay away from ever putting myself in that position. But I think to some extent it's unavoidable. And one of, the, one of the things that we pointed out right at the beginning, it was our leading message, was that this dichotomy between lives and the economy was a false one, that um, economies do nothing other than mediate life. And I think it's probably the case that if you live in a developing nation as we do, that you're more acutely aware of that because you have a substantial portion of the population who occupy a rung in society that is uh, marginally above poverty. And when you hammer the economy, as our 300 day lockdown has done, what you do is you push people into poverty and pushing people into poverty has a mortality consequence all of its own. Um, I find it almost extraordinary that this point even has to be made. Um, but people very much are still walking around and talking the lingo of lives versus economy, which is, you know, failing to complete the story. It's lives versus an economy which mediates lives and therefore lives versus lives. And so this is not a case of being callous or unempathetic. It's actually enlarging the framework of empathy to encompass a holistic picture of all the individuals in society, young, old, vulnerable, non-vulnerable and trying to take another way that instead of hammering the vulnerable, the poor, uh, in favor of the Zoomsters and the, those who are fortunate enough to be able to work from home offices and social distance without any real economic consequence, 
you know, they're, they're being protected. It's the poor and the vulnerable who are being hammered by these policies. And um, I think that that's very clearly evident now in the data as well. When you look at what happens to aggregate mortality, whether on an excess mortality basis or on an official coronavirus mortality basis, you can see no protective effect overall from lockdowns. The holistic picture is just a dreadful one. You know, just to add to that, I think what's been so fascinating through this whole thing is what's been revealed once again is is people's relatively deficient understandings of what an economy is and what it does and, and why we trade and why we produce and why we create stuff. Um, you know, so you've had you've had all along this <clears throat> as Nick says, this false dichotomy of lives versus money. And if you were anti-lockdown, you were supposedly some kind of heartless, you know, monopoly man uh, hoping to to cash in um, and you didn't care about lives. But but as we like to say, and this is one of the points we've been trying to hammer home uh, throughout this episode, um, the economy is our life support machine. It, it, is, it is our biggest and most important life support machine. We only have things like hospitals because we have um, a wealth creating system uh, and, and you know subject to to rules and regulations uh, that we call the marketplace. We you know we only have healthcare because we've we've created all this prosperity through the system of production and trade. Um, and so to think that you could just switch off an economy that you can just kind of turn off. Um, various buttons, uh, things that you deem essential or non-essential, um, is has been a flawed, you know, understanding right from the beginning. What you what you're doing is you're turning off our most important life support machine, and I think I think we've seen that in in you know in various ways. We've seen it in the the joblessness, um, uh, the huge joblessness uh, wave that that's hit since since lockdowns began. We saw that in the U.S. numbers. We've certainly seen that in the, in the South African numbers. Um, we've seen a rise in poverty. Obviously, in a place like South Africa, you got way more people on the poverty threshold. But you would get similar effects even in the U.S. You know, at, at the low rungs of of incomes income stratification, you're going to get people being pushed into very very desperate and immunocompromised. This is the key thing: immunocompromised situations which are going to create um, a greater disease burden going forward. And then, of course, you've had this, this spirit of fear that's been generated where people in lockdowns have been discouraged from visiting uh, hospitals, have been discouraged from cancer checkups, from diabetes checkups. And so you're loading a bigger burden on the hospitals down the line. And you know, a real concern I have is that we get into a bit of a doom loop where lockdowns create, uh, in the long run, uh, healthcare capacity constraints which supposedly require more lockdowns to ease the the the, the constraints on hospitals, um, and you might get these temporary reprieves, and then you get the next big surge um, in, into hospitals. And I'm really concerned that 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 we're risking something like that. But I think the big message is, economies are life support machines, not just ventilators and not just hospitals. These things are we we get up every day to trade, and to produce and to consume, um, first and foremost to survive and to improve. Um, our life conditions and our quality of life and our quantity of life as well. Um, this is all bound up in this thing we have called an economy. And to see the, the degree to which this has been damaged in 2020 um, on the basis of very, very flimsy evidence and really a kind of um, quite a maverick playbook uh, has been really concerning and is storing up, I think, some real challenges down the line. So I think that's a... a my viewers are very familiar with my view of an economy as just people doing favors for other people, right? You generate a small amount of surplus, you can offer that surplus to another person in exchange for something you would like, whether that's consumption in the future or whether that is an alternate form of consumption that you weren't able to produce, right? So I think we're incredibly aligned on that. But at the end of the day, I got to push back, right? Because there are excess deaths, right? There is, this is not an attempt to deny that more people we have better data in the United States than in many other places, but more people are dying or have died in 2020 and will almost certainly die in 2021 than in other years. What's the reaction to that? Like, how do you address the need to show leadership in that dynamic and do something to make people feel, if nothing else, that 
is being addressed? There's very little, I think, that you can do to encourage governments to take action. Um, what the kind of actions that have happened here have been the catastrophe. We, you know, so our view is that excess mortality would have would have been lighter without lockdown. And it's it's interesting. You you say where we can see the data. Yeah, that, that's that's a great point because in most countries you actually can't pick out the mortality from coronavirus from the rest. But if you look at the United Kingdom right now, there's a clear misattribution of deaths going on in the. Um, coronavirus official statistics. And what you see when you burrow into the actual all-cause mortality statistics is that the deaths that are causing the, that are driving excess deaths in the UK are non-COVID deaths. They have nothing to do with respiratory viruses. And the respiratory virus deaths are actually below normal. So at the moment, you've got excess positive excess mortality in the UK driven by non-COVID causes and below normal respiratory virus mortality, and they're in the second lockdown. Well, you mentioned this dynamic of misattribution. Yeah. Why would why would anyone label a non-COVID death a COVID death? That seems conspiratorial. What, what what's the rationale for making that claim? You you would be the first one to go for incentives, right? In the United States, your government, your federal government, pays hospitals for every COVID case and COVID death that they have. And they also exempt them from uh, liability owing to nosocomial infection, uh, which is not the case, for example, if a person contracts the flu in a hospital, then the hospital is liable for the related costs. But in the case of coronavirus, that doesn't apply. So you have fairly strong incentives in the United States. But stepping back from that, that sort of narrow economic lens, this is all part of a grand hysteria. It is really a grand hysteria on the go. This tendency, first of all, to talk about cases on the basis entirely of a test and not on the basis of actual clinical symptoms, that is a completely novel treatment. And it's ridiculous. You, well, that's, yeah, that's a very, very important statement. So I, I just want to emphasize this. So when you talk about this idea of a novel treatment or a novel diagnosis, Typically, I would go to the doctor because I have a runny nose, a fever, I feel achy, et cetera. The doctor might then order a flu test and find that I am diagnosed with the flu. Here, we're talking about testing people who are asymptomatic, without symptoms. And in many cases, we're finding that they are showing virus in their bloodstream, right, through a PCR type test, right? Is that not quite? I mean, okay, you, they're showing they're showing uh, elements of viral RNA, and one of the problems is that you run into uh, what's called a live dead problem. So you don't know whether the virus, whether the the RNA fragments that are being detected, are parts of a competent virus that is capable of replicating, or not whether they're fragments of virus that have been left in the body after a person has recovered from an infection. And that might sound like a fine point um, or putting a fine point, too fine a point on it, but it's very serious because the infectious window is approximately a week long, maybe give or take a few days. Um, whereas this uh, ability to detect RNA fragments in a person's um, test sample can persist for months, as many as three months after recovery. So you're detecting as positive and referring to as a case, a person who m never had a clinical infection, was never symptomatic, whose body, whose natural immunity dealt with the virus, chopped it up, and then three months later you flag this, this person goes and gets tested for whatever reason, and you suddenly define that as a case. This is, uh, makes um, no sense medically, clinically. It's never been done before. And it's driven an enormous amount of uh, hysteria. So I, I want to push back on that, though, right? Because what you're actually seeing is you're seeing evidence of the virus. So it clearly had to have been a case, right? So you've, you've found mm -hmm. that. Okay. Uh, uh, normally, medically, a case is somebody who's sick. So it may not have been a, a case at all. Uh, you know, we you can't... The only way your body 
the only way immunity is usefully defined, uh, barring one or two fine exceptions, which we can go into if you want. But the only way in which immunity is defined really is the, the virus enters your body and then you either are immune to it or, you, or you're not. Immune means you, you are, your body prevents you from becoming severely ill or even ill at all after, upon infection. Okay, so your 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 you, your body will mount an immune response in response to this virus, and there are viruses entering our body all the time, uh, hundreds of them, many presumably which are not yet identified by science. We live continually exposed to viruses, and we don't refer to ourselves as having had a case of every virus that enters our body every day, because otherwise we'd be just case riddled. You know, um, walking, well, this is this is actually a really important point, and you've taken me where yeah. I was hoping to go with this. I mean, first of all, when we talk about a PCR test, we insert a swab way up into the nasal cavity. We take a swab off of a mucous membrane, and part of the reason we do that, obviously, is because the largest component of our immune system is actually our dermal layer, or epidermis, more accurately, right? It's a layer of dead skin that protects our body from constantly being assaulted by every virus or every bacteria that we could possibly come right. into contact with, right? So there has to be an ingress point in which nutrients and elements can be exchanged, for example, breathing oxygen. It has to have a way to get in. It can't penetrate through our dermal layer, right? We're checking inside to see what we're finding there. And the tools that we use, you mentioned this has been unprecedented. This is, this is, a, the first pandemic, certainly within the developed world, where the tools of PCR RT, right? So polymerase chain reaction reverse transcriptase is being used for the tracking and diagnosis of infections. And the, the pushback that you might get is the infections are being used to monitor transmission vectors, right? That theoretically it could be used to help us test and trace. Um, but the process of doing that, I think, is poorly understood, right? So, so PCRRT takes viral fragments, as you are identifying, effectively by identifying what can, can mix and match or what gets left over. And, and the process that makes it work is what's called amplification, right? So yeah. cycle thresholds. Yeah. As I understand it, the normal threshold for testing is somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to 35 cycle thresholds. And effectively what you're doing at a CT of 30 is you're amplifying this, the, the sample by a billion times. You're effectively yeah. concentrating it by a billion times so that you can identify stuff. Yeah. Does that match with how, is my understanding correct there? Yeah, 100%, yeah, it's a very good summation. Okay, so an aggressive test would often have a cycle threshold of 35, which is effectively That's taking that, that CT of 30 and increasing the amplification, the concentration 32 fold, correct? Yeah, yeah. So if I look at standards that are being used in the United States, for example, I, I just happened to be interacting with an individual and he was skeptical of this issue, right? This dynamic of live dead, false positives, et cetera. The state of Kansas, for example, which just happened to be one of the first that I Googled, uses a CT threshold for COVID diagnosis of 42, yeah. which is 4,100 right. times amplification from a base level CT 30, right? Yeah. And when you think about that, it fits very well with this, right? It's not that doctors are maliciously or malintently um, identifying that people have COVID because they're trying to improve their bottom line or they're yeah. trying to improve their hospital bottom line, although I'm sure that has an impact. But there's an extraordinary advantage for precisely that point once you set a cycle threshold at 42, both for the hospital and for the test manufacturers, because suddenly there's incredible demand for reimbursed tests. And for that matter, the local government that is seeking reimbursement for these deaths and these conditions, right? Is a CT yeah. of 42, has anyone ever used anything like that before? Well, no, I mean, I, I think the answer's got to be yes in the sense that, you know, we're, we're in other settings, uh, such, ampli such amplification was appropriate. The question is really, is it appropriate in this setting? And the answer from everything you read is no. You know, you 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 will at this kind of level. If you if 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 a person's sample fails to test positive, 
at 30, but triggers at uh, 40, 42 or 47, as they're using in Ontario province, as we found out a couple of months ago, um, you are you are dealing with any number of potential categories of false positive. Um, and I think it's maybe worthwhile, Mike, just 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 quickly tightening up some of the terminology here, because there's a hell of a lot of confusion around this concept of false positives. People will pick up an article and say, oh, look, the false positive rate for PCR tests when you use the following method is very low, like one in a thousand or whatever. And that statement is correct under conditions of perfect lab hygiene and sanitation and setting settings where your objective is not to determine whether a person is infectious or not, but to determine whether or not the RNA exists in the sample. So that's a very narrow definition of false positive, and we refer to that as the method false positive. And by and large, method false positives for PCR tests are indeed extremely low. And that's what people get confused about, because they hear this concept that PCR tests have very high um, sensitivity and pretty good specificity. Okay. I, I also want to pause for one second there, Wait, Nick, for one second, because I also want to address that dynamic on false positive, right? What you're actually testing for. The idea yeah. that it is false positive can mean two things. It's a, it, it is a misdiagnosis of the symptomatic disease, right? Yeah. It's also a test for is the viral fragment present in the sample? Right. And yes. so the claim that that is that it is inaccurate on that basis is patently false. Right. It is present Correct. in the sample. It's present okay. in the sample with high reliability. And okay. that's that's your method false positives. The next the next layer of false positive is the operating false positive. And this this concept relates to contamination of the sample in the lab. And that interacts with the cycle threshold that you're using, because if you get a very small uh, accidental exposure in the lab of the sample, and then amplify the thing a trillion times, you will you will find that RNA in the sample, or you're more likely to find the RNA in the sample. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's an interaction between the operating false positive level of a laboratory setting and the number of cycles that you're using in your testing protocol. And that's a much bigger problem. In, in, in the United Kingdom, where they have ramped up the capacity of testing very quickly, they've been unable to maintain the quality of the lab, te lab technicians. And so it's, very, there's very clear evidence of widespread generation of operating false positives. And, well, that's, and a, that's a great point. I mean, just very quickly, when you think about that type of dynamic, um, and Russell, actually, I'd love for you to chime in on the economic dynamics and the incentives behind some of this. But if you think about the lab conditions that you're describing, the shortage of qualified lab technicians, you're also talking about taking samples in open air tents. You're talking about taking samples in facilities that are have become high throughput that were never intended to be high throughput. Right. You're talking about the dynamics of amplification as we were talking at 42 is 4,000. If you were to take that up to 47, I was unaware of that for Ontario. Right, you're talking another five doublings, right? I mean, these are absurd conditions that are reminiscent of all the Lysol commercials you see where they zoom in on your trash can and say, look at all the germs that exist in your trash can, right? Well, mm -hmm. I don't use Lysol in my trash cans. I seem to survive just fine, but I do use Lysol on occasion if something's particularly stinky, right? So there is a, a dynamic of magnitude and appropriateness to it. Russell, when you think about these dynamics on the incentives for this type of mass testing that appears ineffective in terms of the diagnosis, right? Because what you're doing is diagnosing the um, asymptomatic and those who are unlikely to be affected and creating this dynamic. How do you think about that from a, an incentive standpoint? That's a great question. And I think in many ways, the incentive question runs is a thread that runs through so much. Nick touched on it with, you know, with just COVID classifications in hospitals and getting federal federal payouts uh, in terms of that. Um, I mean, I think what we've got is an entire new sub-industry developing in the healthcare system here. And I think that there must be people making huge amounts of money um, on this process. PCR testing is very expensive. Um, if you travel these days, you need to, to produce negative PCR tests to be able to get on a plane and come back home or go to your destination that you need to get to. Um, 
And uh, with these kinds of cycle thresholds in place, that seems to me to be a very, very poor incentive structure because one of the things that occurs is that it's easier to test positive, meaning that you're going to have to quarantine, you're, you're not going to be allowed to travel, and two weeks later, you're going to have to take another test. Um, and so you're kind of building into this whole system, um, I think, quite a perverse incentive to to uh, over-test, um, to charge inordinate amounts of money for this testing. Um, and really, I think you're, you're, you're creating some some huge windfalls for, for you know, uh, the guys who are running, you know, the, the, the companies that are running these uh, these test kits and producing these test kits. So I think it's just another in a, in a, in a pretty long series of, of, of poor incentives. I mean, I think that there's some, there's some bad political incentives at play here as well with, with some of these lockdowns and, and the way in which governments are exerting more and more control um, over their societies. And that's, that's just that's just a public choice. That's just standard public choice theory, right? I mean, bureaucrats want to grow their authority and their reach. And uh, Robert Higgs wrote a great book about this around 1987 called Crisis and Leviathan. And 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 governments love using the pretext of crisis to expand their scope and expand their reach and to grow. And then once that starts to snowball, you get this kind of oligarchification dynamic going on where where your big big healthcare providers big pharmaceutical businesses and just generally companies that can participate in these big regulatory structures um, this all kind of starts to snowball in a very dangerous direction and I think the incentive structures here can can uh, can become very poor so that's definitely something we're concerned about and I think you're seeing you, you definitely see it on display in the PCR uh, in, the, in the whole PCR testing system so one of the things that we talked about a little bit are, is the dynamic of masks. And many people, including yourselves, are have taken the position that masks are not effective, right? That they are ineffective in controlling a respiratory virus when you are using a cotton mask or a bandana or a handkerchief. And, and the, the thought process that most people would immediately gravitate to is when you say respiratory droplets, what you're thinking of is spittle or mucus or relatively um, large particles, and those are clearly filtered by that type of, of instrument. One of the points that you guys have made, and I think it's a very good one, is that what you're actually doing is storing those droplets in the mask itself, and therefore, as you continue to breathe through the mask, you're actually aerosol aerolyzing those, turning it into an aerosol. Um, those particles, making them finer and actually causing them to persist in the atmosphere and the air surrounding you for a longer period of time. You're effectively creating a Petri dish in which to grow the viral fragments if they're there. But there's another aspect to masks, and, and Nick, you're shaking your head, so I'm going to let you correct me if anything I said was wrong, but there's another yeah. aspect, which is the social dynamic. So let me hit, hit on my analysis of the health dynamic, and then we can come back to the social dynamic. Okay. Yeah, yeah, just briefly, I mean, our, our position is that we're against mask mandates for the same reason that we're against or for the same for, for the same reason as uh, we're against lockdowns, uh, namely that general suppression measures shift the disease burden onto the, the healthy. So uh, sorry, onto the vulnerable. So, you know, our, our perspective is, well, we better hope that they don't work because everybody's wearing them. And if they work, then they'll be shifting the disease burden onto the vulnerable. So we hope they don't work. That's our first point. OK, um, we don't think there should be a, a general mask man that should be used for this reasoning. And we have a great deal of concern about the overstatement of their efficacy, both in terms of protecting the wearer and in terms of protecting people around the wearer. We think those by overstating uh, those cases, you potentially put people at risk because they get a false sense of security. So we, we are pretty sure there are effects from wearing masks that may be slightly helpful. that will be small effect sizes, um, slightly helpful in terms perhaps of disease transmission, but they're also likely to be harms. Uh, again, open, the open question as to how harmful they are and, and how big the effect sizes are. What you were going on to now is where we think the meat and potatoes of the issue is, which is the social aspect. And I'll leave it to you to introduce that. Sure. So, so, so my view has largely morphed into the dynamic that yes, masks are performative, 
but that they increasingly represent an indication of support for your fellow citizens or fellow humans. That you're effectively saying, look, I understand I'm being inconvenienced, whether I agree with this or not, it is one minor way that I can demonstrate my broader support, right? Now, I, I've got to confess, actually, Russell, when I presented this, um, had one of the more interesting rejoinders to that. And so, you know, I'll, I'll let you guys react to that, but it kind of falls broadly into this class of masks. Are, is not wearing them a statement of actual medical science and the right choice, or is it a giant fuck you to society, to use the uh, the, the, the non-network language, right? <laughs> Russell, what, what's what's your reaction to my hypothesis about the value of the performative aspect of it? Uh, well, f firstly, it's it's really interesting to hear you say that because whenever I've debated people on this issue in casual social settings, that's kind of where they end up. <clears throat> they sort of end up admitting, yeah, you know, there's there's probably no major difference that masks make, but I kind of feel like I'm I'm a good person and I'm signaling to my community that that I'm a good person. And in a way, this is kind of the perfect the perfect uh, way to demonstrate virtue in a virtue signaling world that we live in, you know? So so that's really I, as interesting. As I just did so successfully, I am a virtuous exactly. person, yes. Exactly, Michael, <laughs> you, you, you're doing the right thing. But um, in, in, from what I can see and from what I can tell so far, I, I think that these mask mandates are, in, are, are actually causing social conflict. I, I think they're exacerbating uh, the potential for social conflict. So what's really interesting is prior to, to this COVID episode, um, most people, certainly in the West, um, had, had, a very, had a very benign opinion about masks and certainly would never have considered mask wearing a thing for healthy people. Maybe in very polluted environments, or if you're an inc if, if you're if you're incredibly sick and displaying you know severe flu symptoms, some people in the West would wear masks. But but prior to this, very very few I would say. Um, and you've gone from from that to if you don't wear a mask, you deserve a three hundred dollar fine, and you're a bad person. And you know in South Africa you know, crazily, you can actually get a criminal record. You can get arrested now for not wearing a mask and, and you will get a criminal record. Um, and so I think what's happened is that the signaling from policymakers around this has sort of, has, has, has raised the stakes, the social stakes, if you like, and really amplified the, the potential for conflict around this because some people believe that the mandates and and uh, are are legitimate and they believe that wearing masks are you know are very helpful to to stop the spread of the virus but some people find these masks a tremendous imposition they in principle are against the mask mandates because they're an infringement they are an infringement upon people's liberty forcing people to wear a a piece of cloth in front of their face in certain conditions and for long periods of time is tremendously inhibitive um, and restrictive. And I suppose in many ways, that's the point. They, they hope that people will just stay at home and not go out and wear the masks. And so in a way, it's kind of an addendum to the lockdown psychology that you kind of hope people will, will, will stay at home. My take is that people who feel vulnerable, they can use masks as a signal to society that they feel vulnerable. And that actually elicits far more uh, empathy from people who don't necessarily think that they should wear masks or want to wear masks. But as they look upon people now who can be singled out as people who feel vulnerable, they can be respectful to them. Maybe they will even take a mask out of their pocket and put it on uh, for that particular interaction. Maybe they will give them a wide berth out of respect uh, in, a, in, a, in a shopping mall or, or what have you. Um, so by by creating a blanket mandate, you actually eliminate the ability to identify people, to identify people who feel at risk, to show empathy to those people. So I, I really don't see that we've enhanced social cohesion here. And and I've I've heard of and seen numerous instances where real conflict has arisen over over very petty things, but around this 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 notion that the mask 
is is imperative and if you take it off you're literally endangering people's lives if you take this mask off and you walk around you are a menace to society that's where we've raised the stakes to and i don't see any any social good coming out of that i think if we dial it back to a recommendation to if you feel vulnerable but you need to go somewhere and you need to interact in the public wear a mask if you're particularly vulnerable wear an n95 mask wear it effectively and other people will be able to treat you with with the utmost respect. For me, that's that's a far more healthy, far healthier way to go ahead. I think that was a very profound statement, and it's one that I don't think is often aired. And there's, we live in a society, I think, that tends to place um, uh, a, a penalty associated with admitting that you are vulnerable, admitting that you are afraid. But I also think that that's silly in the context of a society, right? I mean, part of what we need to be able to do is to share the way that we feel. And that's the other thing that, of course, masks take away from us. I have no idea whether you bumped into me with aggression or with accident, et cetera, when you take away that immediate facial uh, expression that is created by our very flexible mouths, right? That, you know, when I'm left to, to try to assess the wrinkling of your eyes, for example, right? That becomes very difficult as a society. It also has huge implications for the development of children who are growing up in a society and walking around and never seeing strangers' facial expressions, not being able yeah. to understand that somebody is smiling at them as compared to glaring at them from behind a mask, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to be, I mean, we, we are yeah. engaged in one of the worst controlled experiments of all time to see what would happen if we raise young children without access to genuine human interaction, particularly with strangers, right? This is going to be fascinating. I, I, fascinating I think is not the right word. Probably fascinating. Yeah. I, I think, I think most people, not, not everyone, but, but I think, I think the majority of people are getting behind the idea that, that masking children all day long in a school environment or, or, you know, those kind of settings is, is child abuse. Quite frankly, I mean, I mean, putting a piece of cloth uh, that that's going to get wet and and snotty and and dirty um, in a school setting. I mean, you just you just create a you know you just create a sickness vector there that's that's going to take it all to another level. And you're doing a whole bunch of psychological damage to the children. I would also push back. You know, there's this very common sort of refrain that uh, it's just a mask. You know, grow up and put it on your face. Um, I got to say, I find the mask wearing beyond 15 or 20 minutes um, in hot weather. And, you know, I live in Africa, but, you know, parts of America get, get incredibly warm during the summer months. I find it an incredibly um, oppressive and inhibitive thing to have to do. I, I don't find it easy at all. And I think, I think there's many people who agree with me. So wearing the mask for, for half an hour in cool weather I can get my head around that wearing it in a, in a hot environment for eight hours in a row or wearing it for an hour while you're in some sort of public setting in very, very hot temperatures. I find it an incredibly difficult thing to do. And I think many people do. I, I don't buy this notion that, that strapping this thing on your face is just, is just this, this sort of, you know, ultra low cost way to show solidarity with your fellow man. I, I, I don't buy that. And I think that there's, there's a lot of people that are with me on that. Um, and, and you can see more and more frustration amongst people um, as they face something like a mask mandate. And these fines and, and criminal records and, and, and uh, sanctions that are now coming for this, to me, are absolutely unconscionable. So let me, let me push forward to the next component, which is you know, everything you guys are saying, I appreciate and I understand. But the reality is, and this is particularly true in the developed world, is we're in the dead of winter. I'm looking outside at my warm California weather, having given away to the raining season, which you can really appreciate in dry climates, but is still nonetheless uh, uh, cold and dismal. And we're seeing the hospital statistics suggest that we are running out of capacity. Don't we need to do something? What's wh What are we missing that would allow you to be so cavalier about the fact that here in Marin County, we only have 6% capacity left in our ICU. Look, I mean, you know, it, it's important to understand the focused, the focused protection strategy is better than doing nothing, which in turn is better than a general mandate. 
a general coercive practice, whether it's lockdown or masks. Okay. So we're, we're recommending, by recommending the least death strategy, we're also recommending the least hospital burden strategy. And it doesn't mean do nothing. It, it means focus your resources on protecting the vulnerable and let everybody get on with their lives and develop immunity as quickly as possible amongst people to whom the risk of this disease is absolutely negligible. That's, that's the simple statement. But Nick, I mean, I still have only 6% capacity in the ICU, and I'm going to run out of that capacity if this pandemic continues to accelerate, regardless of whether I've caused it by lockdowns or exacerbated these conditions. Shouldn't I be afraid of only 6% remaining capacity in the ICU? If you haven't secured sufficient surge capacity in your hospital system, that's not that's not a, a reason to lock down or to install mask mandates or to do any of these things. Um, I, I mean, it, it's helpful just to step back and look at the broader picture of, of appropriate public health policy. You don't start by scaring the hell out of everybody. That that was the first mistake that was made here was this idea that if you that that people are such muppets, if you don't terrorize the hell out of them, then they won't do sensible things. And so they started by massively overstating the threat of the disease, causing everybody to be terrified, people to believe that their children were going to die, you know, whereas actually for children, this disease represents much lower risk than the flu that they've had every season for billions of years, you know. Um, so don't terrorize people. Don't lie to them. Don't tell them that things work when they don't. Don't scare them with theories that have no substance in science. I mean, we've not discussed asymptomatic transmission as a driver in this epidemic. That's a bogus story. It's a rare event. It's not an epidemic driver. And the reason we're locking down and wearing masks is because of this lie about asymptomatic transmission. So all of these stories about what, what you're meant to do in responsible public health to keep people calm, keep panic situations from arising, prevent hospitals from being overburdened. All of those rules are just being ignored. And I, I think they're driving a lot of this. So for example, if you're using 42 cycle PCR tests to test your healthcare workers and quarantining the ones who trip up positive, you, you're probably quarantining people who've got absolutely no chance of infecting anybody and taking out capacity from the system. You know, well, the other thing that I would just, that, that would highlight on that, that point, and I think you nailed it in terms of alternate ways of handling this would have been better. Yeah. But there is, con there continues to be this overwhelming presentation of quote unquote facts that lack context and are not true yes. in their intent, right? So one of the dynamics that I would highlight is by law, ICUs and emergency facilities have to be capable of operating at 120 to 150 percent of their nameplate rated capacity, right? This is no different than a steel mill running overtime hours relative to its normal production dynamics. Mm. So when we report these types of statistics, as an observer, when I hear 6 percent capacity left, I hear actually, well, no, that means that we've got 31 percent capacity left. And it doesn't, yeah. you know, certainly relative to prior periods, it's nothing. And to Russell's point, it's also creating conditions under which people are terrified to seek treatment for things that will become chronic or mortal in their uh, in their dynamics if failed to be treated under conditions in which people are convinced that there is a shortage of something when there is not. And the last thing that I would just highlight is, is that it is a byproduct of a system that lacks price transparency, right? Price is how you signal shortages. And mm. since we do not actually charge more when we have surge capacity utilization in a hospital or an emergency room, we have very little tools. We have very few tools for figuring out what actually is happening. We rely on the authorities to report it to us. And many people who have taken the time to dig into the data realize that it's not actually what's being presented. Some people who treat that as when it's really important, you have to lie because we can't trust the population. Mm. That to me, and I'd like to transition into the political ramifications of it now, particularly talking about that, that to me is the single most distressing dynamic, that an increasing fraction of our global population 
seems to view it as acceptable to treat your citizens as so unreliable that it is a virtue, not a, a, a venal sin, to lie to your constituents for their own protection. I mean, it's an enormous irony here of this whole fact-checking misinformation circus is that the biggest misinformers in this entire story are governments and the universities who run these data series. I mean, we spoke about this nonsense of referring to people as cases simply on the basis of a PCR test. That means every number that's flashed on every news screen by CNN, by Fox, by whomever, is a, mis a piece of misinformation. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a specific novel type of medical fraud that's going on there. Same with death, cl death classifications. Put it in, in light of what we were talking about, the live dead issue, that you, you can test positive months after having recovered. And now you're putting anybody, marking anybody down as a COVID death if they tested positive within 28 days of death. So it could have been an infection any time in the last three or four months. They might be, you know, totally um, uh, off the clinical picture for a COVID death. So you've got this inflated death series, the, the inflated COVID, uh, the inflated cases series. All of that is misinformation. The asymptomatic transmission story, the overstatement of the effectiveness of masks, or if not the total misstatement on the effectiveness of masks. Um, all of these are chronic misinformation candidates here. And the people who are trying to stand up and say, well, not so fast, here's the real picture. Let's put this in context. Let's get some perspective. Let's compare this response to what we did for other pandemics like this. Those people are being censored, deplatformed, cast into the den of fact checkers. We've, societally, we've lost our minds. I agree with that. I think at its core, this is, you use the idea that this is a collective hysteria. To me, this is no different than the children's crusade or various time periods where people have convinced themselves of the need to act and the need to act in a panicked fashion, right? Russell brought up the idea um, of the idea of stress. I believe it was Russell brought up the idea of stress as a contributor to the excess deaths. That's unquestionably the case. The cortisol response within our body requires us to take resources from other areas, including our immune system, right? It places pressures on our circulatory and respiratory systems. It exacerbates basically everything. Your body is intentionally shutting down aspects of its functioning so that it can concentrate resources in a, in a life or death situation or what's perceived as a life or death situation. Robert Sapolsky has a fantastic book called Zebras Don't Get Ulcers because they aren't exposed to these types of chronic stress environments that we have now exposed everybody to, right? Yeah. Um, and it, that can be quite an immediate effect. And if you looked at what went on in, in New York City, where the, the fear levels were probably the highest that they reached anywhere on the planet, um, you had people who were arriving at hospital with nothing clinically wrong with them, but they were just being so incredibly anxious. And then, you know, they, they would be... Um, exposing themselves in the very worst setting to the disease. So nosocomial infections account for, I think, upwards of 85% of uh, total infections. So, you know, there, there, there are these anecdotes of people who were arriving at the hospital for one reason only. They were scared. They were scared out of their wits. So, and, so, um, in the so hospital, let's actually talk about why that is. You, you, you hit on the yeah. dynamics of misinformation that's been spread. You've yeah. hit on the dynamics. I've talked in other components about the politician's desire to cover your ass, right? The CYA type dynamics. You mentioned the dynamics of a hospital preventing, protecting itself from liability uh, in, in terms of a positive COVID test shields them in the way that an influenza test might not. When you think about the broader component, I'm drawn to what I believe is one of the key issues that we're facing, which is the rise in China's influence on the world and their attempt to discredit the Western regimes um, effectively to reinforce their own credit. We saw the same dynamic in the 1920s and the 1930s with the rise of Stalin or of Hitler in terms of their continual presentation of having found the solution, right? The Japanese, the Germans, the Italians under Mussolini with fascism had found the solution to markets that no longer functioned, right? That was, that was the argument. It feels very similar here. 
that it was what is actually being driven is in large part influenced by a con by a concerted attempt from China to drive a particular response function and behavior in the West. Do you see that as well, or am I, you know, uh, am I experiencing China derangement syndrome? No, we, we definitely see that. But the part that I think a lot of people are underestimating is is how many people in the West deeply sympathize with the authoritarian technocratic approach of the Chinese. Um, and we see signs of that all over the place. So yes, there's very much, there was very much an element of Chinese propaganda in the promotion of this uh, strategy of lockdown, which contradicted all pre-COVID science. Um, that's there, we're not gonna uh, deny that. But you have to look at how close some of the leading actors in this whole story are to the Chinese and how in favor they are of the Chinese methods. And I'm gonna speak frankly here, it's the Gates Foundation, it's the WEF, and it's the World Health Organization. There's a cuddly club of large super supranational entities who worship the very ground that the Chinese walk on, who envy them, their centralized approaches, their authoritarian approaches. I want to make sure that I clarify your language there. So when you say envy, they don't actually envy China's condition. They don't want to live in China in a more polluted, um, more crowded, uh, less free regime. But what you're referring to when you say they envy it is they envy the efficiency with which a subset of the population can force what they believe to be the right changes upon society. Right? Whether the coercive power. They envy the coercive power. I think that is very clear. And I do agree with you. And again, turning back to history, the levels of support for the Chinese, for the US Communist Party, which was under the influence of Stalin and others as we went into the 1930s, that was very, very high. There was a tremendous amount of sympathy for the inevitability, the pure mathematics, the simplicity of moving to a communist system under which all were able to share under uh, of, of the resources of society in a way that felt more fair and egalitarian because it was being done in a scientific manner. Right. And, it and feels that, like we're actually, right back there. That actually gave FDR a lot, a lot more license to, to be far more centralizing, to be far more heavy handed from a regulatory perspective. Um, and it was it was an American style kind of light light authoritarianism, right? It wasn't it wasn't what you saw in Europe, and it wasn't what you saw in Japan, but it was certainly a, a big change from what had gone had gone before. And uh, there, there's a very very interesting parallel with that, I think, in today's in today's world. Um, and there's this there's this real appeal of the of the Chinese kind of let's call it this sort of techno authoritarianism, right? Social credit scoring, integrating everything on on a single tech platform, um, where you can you, you can nudge and control and and incentivize and disincentivize the population from all kinds of behavioral structures, and you can stick it into these these you know algorithms that that tech people you know have a lot of fun playing with. Um, this is something that China has been rolling out for a number of years, and and this does look like. Um, that it looks like coronavirus and the fear that's been able to be drummed up around this um, and the sort of license for authoritarianism around this is driving us toward that kind of scenification um, of of the West. And and you know we often talk about Nick and I we talk about the, these two these two opposing dynamics the centralizing dynamic and the sort of subsidiarity dynamic this this notion that um, you have you have a centralizing uh, imperative, um, but you also have people trying to push for um, for decentralized solutions for you know not just decentralized market solutions but decentralized political solutions as well. Um, you know, for all the United States' faults, and of course it's got many many virtues as well. But one of the virtues through all this is is the state level the state level responses that you've been able to have. That's been very interesting to witness 
And it's been fascinating to see the robustness of the federal system in the United States. You don't have a one-size-fits-all lockdown for 330 million people. That's interesting. I mean, I think, and, and in the US, it actually even goes to, to, to that sort of county level, as, as far as, you know, if I'm correct. So there's a state level mandate, but but you can even get county level differences and county level enforcements. That's something that's got to be maintained. That 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 decentralized uh, authority in the United States is is one of the best things going for the U.S. Pulling pulling functions towards Washington, towards D, towards D.C., and creating these one size fits all federal responses would be, I think, a regressive uh, dynamic and a, and a regressive path to go. So so that's that's fascinating, and I think I think this is. This centralization versus subsidiarity versus decentralization dynamic, it's an age-old political economy battle. Yeah. And and so it's an age-old war, but new battle lines have been drawn in 2020 and going into 2021. And, uh, you know, I, I think that the historical record is such that if we, if we err excessively towards centralization, uh, we're going to make some very, very egregious errors uh, socially and politically. And now happened, is yeah. a time. Now, now is a time really to fight for, to, 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 to advocate for, and fight for a kind of subsidiarity, a decentralization of power, and a real political pluralism that gets devolved down to down to local levels. And I think I actually think that that's something that has a kind of bipartisan broad basis of support. When you really get into the nuts and bolts, people are very wary of these faraway bureaucracies on left and right, um, of these faraway bureaucracies uh, trying to dictate and trying to control everything. Um, and so there could be some fruitful uh, areas there for, 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 for actually real political unity, but it's going to take a lot of hard work and I think a lot of persuasion that this uh, scenification model is really setting us up for, I think, quite a, quite a disaster. I share that view. And I think that's actually, um, I think, you know, I just had this conversation with my daughter last night. Why do we have the electoral college? Why do we have representative government as compared to a democracy, right? Why do we make these choices? And you bring up a very important point about the United States by having 50 semi-sovereign and countless municipalities within those semi-sovereign states, we encourage a degree of experimentation that actually enhances the overall process, right? I, viewers remember I got into a debate with Jeremy Grantham that, you know, well, the Chinese are figured out X, right? They've got it all centralized, they've got it directed, they're doing, you know, the right choices as it relates in his case to global warming. And my reaction to that was, well, wait a second, actually it was, he was talking about the pandemic response. The vaccines emerged in the United States where it is chaotic and messy and people are capable of experimenting and failing, right? And so you have many of those dynamics that I think people tend to really underappreciate because when you feel fear, you look to quote unquote leadership and leadership is as simple in many situations as acting. The most frightening thing for me is just that it appears that we are increasingly being led by a group of opportunistic grifters who have decided that they are going to take advantage of this regime to create bases of loyalty and the single best way to establish that people are loyal to you is if they will say the most absurd things echoing you, right? So if I tell you the sky is purple and we belong to the purple sky cult believers, if you say, well, I think the sky is kind of a light shade of blue today, you immediately become ostracized and attacked because the only way that I can maintain cohesion in my movement is by doing exactly that, making people close to you within the organization realize the penalty associated with breaking that. And, and I would argue that's what the $300 fines or the $1,000 fines if you're in Quebec, the arrests associated with people not wearing masks or violating a lockdown by visiting their family members for holidays, right? These are terrible, terrible outcomes. We don't have much time left, but I wanted to give just a few seconds in particular to Russell, and I know Nick, you're involved with capital markets as well. How do you guys think about the impact, the confusing impact that we've seen in financial markets this year, where instead of a reaction to the economic travesty that we've seen, most risk asset markets are sitting at all-time highs? What, what do you think is going on? Well, um, I guess the simplest way to answer that is that um, 
in the height of its economic crisis, the Zimbabwean stock market was soaring to to record levels. Um, if you print enough money, anything can go up in in, in nominal dollar values. And you know we're seeing we're seeing this. Uh, you know, it, it, the most clear example of this is Bitcoin, but you're seeing it on the S and P. You're seeing it in a bunch of assets. Um, if you if you increase the U.S. money supply, the dollar money supply by thirty or forty percent over the course of twelve months, things are going to go up in price. At the same time, what you've done is you've dramatically uh, disrupted uh, and uh, supply chains. You've created frictions right across supply chains, um, right across global supply chains. Um, and so, really, I think. I think the big watchword now, and I mean, this is not necessarily a hugely novel insight. A lot of people are focusing on this now, but the big watchword is inflation. You know, we've had we've had ten years of of a kind of disinflation in in the official CPI numbers. I think those are understated for for various inbuilt kind of biases in, in the measurement samples that are taken on that. But but be that as it may, we haven't had a kind of big inflation scenario for the last ten years. And what kind of assets love low inflation, long duration assets? Um, you know, the bond markets are loving low inflation. The tech stocks are loving low inflation. Um, the United States, generally, the US dollar does very well in a low inflation, disinflation world. 2020, to me, seems like it must have been a watershed moment for this. We've we've surged the money supply. We've printed money not only in the US, but of course, across you know Europe, China, Japan, most of the developing world, we're creating liquidity everywhere. Um, and what's going on there really is we're monetizing debt, right? So we're actually diminishing the risk of debt deflationary episodes. But but the flip side of that coin is potential inflation problems down the line, and we're constraining supply chains as well. So, um, And you're starting to see the early signs of an inflationary, I think, of an inflationary regime starting to emerge, right? Emerging markets are doing better. Emerging market currencies on the front foot, the dollars on the back foot. Um, tech stocks are underperforming uh, other other realms of, of the market, even though, you know, companies like Tesla have obviously gone gone nuts. Um, but you're, you're starting to see, I think, a regime shift. Value managers are starting to outperform, you know, the last couple of months. Um, and you're starting to get energy companies, energy stocks doing well, you know, Commodity prices are higher than they were at the start of March. You know, um, if you told someone there was going to be a, a depression in 2020, they would have said commodity prices altogether would be way down. Commodity prices are up. Oils bounce back hugely. So, my feeling is that there's an inflation. There's a there's a whiff of inflation very much in the air. I think we've got to watch that really closely. And that, to me, is just really going to be the way that you start to undermine the monetary illusion, if you like, of all this money printing that, that you're able to create of all, you know, borrowing all these funds from the future, putting your children and grandchildren into, into greater tax slavery, if you like, down the line. We can't run away from this forever. And I think, I think that that's why inflation, I think, is such a key watchword, because as inflation rises, if inflation rises, it's really going to start revealing the, the lack of prosperity that's, that's, not only occurred in 2020, but really has been building up, I think, for a number of years. And our last point quickly I would just add is I think we've got to, we mustn't overly focus on GDP. You can goose GDP numbers with money printing, uh, with with borrowing, government spending just has to go up and the, and the G portion um, of, of the GDP equation goes up. Um, I think we've got to be focusing on what's being done to national balance sheets, Sovereign balance sheets are in a real bad state, um, emerging markets as well as developed markets. And and the politics in a lot of these countries is starting to kind of f become more volatile and fray at the edges and become become a little bit more problematic. Um, and, so, and so I think fiscal risk, whilst not necessarily an imminent threat, is is an increasingly looming threat in a lot of these economies. And I think you're just you're just really wreaking havoc on, on national balance sheets. So the GDP number, the income statement, you, you might be able to to goose up and, and make it look not so bad and you get these big rebounds in Q3 and Q4 this year, but we're doing a lot of damage to national balance sheets and uh, that's a big concern for me. I certainly see it in South Africa, I see it in the US, 
right across Europe, we're seeing it. Uh, China is is a vulnerable economy too. You know, they they want to project that they've sailed through this whole thing. Uh, I don't believe they have. Um, and I think there's some there's ongoing lingering um, uh, financial system problems in China. There's other aspects of China that that are that are that are looking better than the West, and and we can have a that's a whole rabbit hole we can get into about about China and the West. But certainly, I think uh, we've had some some big uh, blows in 2020, um, and a bit of money printing and a bit of borrowing from the future by our governments, by cash strapped governments, might make things things look okay in the short term. I think gold, Bitcoin, some of these some of these you know these these uh, investment safe havens, these inflation sensitive assets, these kind of hard money assets are really showing us what's going on underneath the hood. And, and I don't think it's it's very pretty. And I think we're, we're, we're moving more rapidly towards, um, I think, some some very, very destabilizing financial events. Of course, we don't know when. And of course, this can run a lot longer than than we all think, right? So you've got to you know, if you're if you're in that game, you kind of have to have to keep some chips on the table there. You got to stay invested. You got to play with your peer group to a large degree. But I think I think increasingly adopting you know smart hedging strategies in a world that's um, that I think through the course of 2020 has gotten really crazy. Uh, I think is is prudent. So so the the policy responses that that we've seen are being lauded by many on the left and many kind of Keynesians and and monetarists. But I think uh, there's some real problems that we that, that are brewing uh, over the next couple of months and years, Michael. Nick, any perspective from the private equity or middle market areas? No, because it's it's all uh, really you know it comes down to the same story: what's happening in the real economy and what are the prices of assets. We we are shielded from this day-to-day fluctuation of market values, which uh, gives everybody a slightly <laughs> much longer term perspective than would happen in public companies. And and thank goodness for that. But what what I would say is, you know, at times like this, I think it's very important to take a step back from questions of this asset class or this segment of the market and and to look at the bigger picture. There are too many bogus narratives around. You know, if you look at the the the, the coronavirus story, the entire thing is a bogus bogus narrative. You know, the the idea that there's this there's a deadly virus out there and uh, we none of us are immune to it and. We're all susceptible. If we don't lock down and wear masks, we're all going to die and there's no cure and so on. That's the story. That's the drama that is uh, in everybody's heads. But the reality is very different. The reality is, yes, there's a respiratory virus, very similar to ones that have been with us for, as far as we know, our entire human history. Um, we have, and we can, most people can mount a good immune response. This is not a big threat for them. It's a danger to the elderly, and we need to react like we have to similar viruses in the past. You know, it's two completely different stories, but the bogus narrative is dominant. So too with the, the economic world. We've got people who command the airwaves saying, don't worry about the debt, it's just debt to ourselves. Yeah. That's a bogus narrative too. Yeah. It- I, I agree with what you're saying. I do think um, in the same way that I've reviewed some of your materials, I would encourage you guys to look at some of the stuff that I've done on these types of narratives and what are actually driving them. I continue to believe that uh, a large part of what we're actually experiencing is markets that are increasingly being driven by non-economic forces, uh, right. both structural and others. Um, but I do think that's actually a really good place for us to to, to wrap it up and suggest that in all of these components, there is a narrative, there is a quote unquote truth, and then there is a deeper truth, which is kind of how do we want to behave as a society? How do we want to uh, see our leaders behave going forward? And I think the most frightening thing that I have seen has been the dynamic of our fellow citizens of the world, whether they're in our individual country or elsewhere, turn to authority figures and say, do something, anything you do is better than not doing anything at all, right? And so, while I think we can be highly critical of many administrations, you mentioned the UK, the United States, the the Johnson and Trump administrations have certainly not set themselves up as having followed an established playbook in an effective manner by any stretch of the imagination. 
But I do think that, that we have to be very cautious of this much broader narrative of what is the information that we're receiving? Why are we being allowed to, be, to see it at this point? What is it trying to get us to do? And I think the more people are capable of asking those questions, and I am internally grateful for you establishing something like Panda that facilitates the dissemination of information that may come from a different perspective than the official data, doesn't necessarily mean that it is completely unbiased, et cetera. Like, I just want to be very clear. You are presenting it in a scientific manner. It is scientific data. The fact that it conflicts with other data that we are receiving is actually part of the beauty of science. Science is always about here is alternate interpretations of the data that we are receiving. Here is a better data set. And the more people begin to actually turn and rely on that sort of approach, I think the better off we're going to be. Gentlemen, this is such a pleasure having you here. Thank you for joining me from South Africa, and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you, It's been a great pleasure, Michael. Thank you so much. Uh, very good. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this special episode of The Interview, the premier business and finance series in the world. However, this is just the tip of the iceberg. For more in-depth content and expert analysis, visit the membership link in the description to unlock a week's access for only $1. This dollar can change your life.